Welcome. You are listening to the Be A Better Being podcast hosted by Michelle Zellner and Sasha Bershide. Michelle and Sasha are here to give you information and inspiration to help you live your healthiest, happiest lives. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy the show. Greetings. Thank you for tuning into the Be A Better Being podcast. I'm Michelle Zellner, your host, and I am joined today by a guest who is long overdue for being on this show. Happy to have Dr. Darian Parker with me today. Dr. D, how are you? I'm doing well. It's nice to be here with you, Michelle. You know, I feel like you were one of my very, very, very first podcast interviews ever back in 2019 when you had just launched your podcast, Dr. D's Social Network. And I have to say, listeners, you've heard me talk about Daring before because anytime I have a guest on who is a connection of you, we always talk about how amazing you are and, (laughs) you know, that you are the ultimate connector and you have definitely introduced a whole bunch of incredible people into my world. And eternally grateful for that. But you are on with me today because it is National Sports and Physical Fitness Awareness Month. And I thought, who better than to come on and talk about this than the 2023 IDEA Personal Trainer of the Year, Dr. Daring Parker. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Michelle. I really appreciate it. Well, you have such a wealth of experience and knowledge from, I think, probably all facets of the fitness world. And I want to kind of explore, well, first of all, we'll talk about you and your journey and how you came to be doing what you are, but I also want to kind of explore the evolution of it all, where you see the industry, even, you know, just what you see kind of as a whole with trends or the population, are they, are they actually getting fitter or, you know, are the fit getting fitter and, and the rest are still not. So we'll talk about some of those things, but let's just give the listeners a little bit of history about who you are and how you came to do what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I appreciate those very nice things you said about me. I, I love connecting people and I feel like this portion of my life, I'm supercharging that even more because I just think it's really important, especially in our industry. So I got into the business like 23 years ago, so it's been a while, and uh, I really love it. I, I, really, I was a collegiate track and field athlete, and I never like identified as really like a fitness person per se. I just, um, sports athletics were always a big part of my life, um, but I always knew that I wanted to be in this industry in some way, shape, or form, and I felt that I wanted to create meaningful relationships in my life. And fitness is just a great way to do that, especially one-on-one and in group settings. Just get to meet so many different people. And my goal is I'll just always be a good person in another person's life and be an example of how I could show kindness, care, and empathy for other people. So fitness has always just been an excellent pathway for me. So I started out in personal training, been doing that for 23 years since the beginning. And eventually I kept training during the time, but also ran a club for over a decade and luxury fitness environment, was a national director of fitness for a global leisure and hospitality company, taught in the uh, academic environment and doing that again at three different colleges. And it's been an awesome ride because I feel like it's just allowed me to have a really meaningful existence in helping other people. There's definitely been other things throughout the course of that, but in a nutshell, that's kind of been my pathway has been the connecting with other people has been a big part of the business for me. And my podcast was just another alignment piece has been just meeting new people and just seeing how I could help them. Well, I think that's something that you and I even just connected on immediately because I started out as a personal trainer almost 27 years ago now, which is You know, back in the day, like there weren't a lot of personal trainers. That was still a relatively new thing for the super wealthy or, you know, the Hollywood stars. And I think just that there are some of us who are still immersed in the world is probably a testament to that we know what we're doing and that people like us and and that it is about that connection. That was something that really immediately grabbed grabbed hold in my own journey of the career was really stumbling into personal training by accident. I didn't seek out to be a trainer, but then just recognizing 
the impact of the connection and that one-on-one -on -one and really getting to know somebody on a much deeper level, not just, hey, do this workout and I'll see you in two days or, you know, whatever kind of that check the box formula tends to be. Going back to when you got your start, what did like what what was the industry like and what were even kind of your typical client and how is that how has that changed over the course of your twenty three years? When I started, I started at James Madison University in the faculty, staff, and fitness facility center. So it was kind of an interesting thing because upstairs in Godwin Hall is where the kinesiology department is, and downstairs was the faculty and staff fitness center for all the professors and other staff members at the university, they could come and work out in this facility. That's where I started training people. So it was interesting was training a lot of the professors who were teaching me during different parts of the week. And I realized then very quickly that just because you have knowledge in something, does it transfer always to how you take care of yourself? And I noticed that very confident professors and their area of expertise were not as confident about their own body and taking care of themselves. So I said, oh, there's a disconnect here. And I like just chatting with people about that and learning about their story and their history. And then after that, just moved into training, continued in the academic environment, and then in the luxury private industry environment, and then, you know, in my own business, doing that in the general public. And I think that clients are more, let's say this, more interested in mental health for training versus how they look. Obviously, the, the visual aspect is still important to people. And certainly people still claim they want to come to you for weight loss and have to talk to them about that and provide quality information related to that, and updated information about what's happening currently. But I think that more people than ever understand that you're, you're doing this because it's a bigger than just the physical attributes of it that people really are starting to understand the today's client, especially in younger clients. When you ask them, why are you training? It's, I just want to feel better about myself. I need a way to cope with my life. I have a lot of anxiety. It's really a lot of talk therapy, especially with a lot of clients currently, which I'm pretty happy about because back in 2007, when I finished my doctorate, it was in behavior modification when there wasn't a lot of discussion about that, there was something that I felt was going to be a large part of the business, which is how do we take care of the psychosocial needs of clients? And this will probably rise to the forefront of the industry at some point as, as a society and as humans, as we take our mental, social, emotional, and spiritual health much more seriously. And I believe we're in the infancy of that. So I think today's trainer and future trainers will have to be extremely well versed in therapeutic communication, talk therapy, almost a dual trainer slash therapist type role, like educationally combining those things, because it's going to be critically important, especially with younger people who are dealing with so much anxiety and depression. And a lot of the training is facing those things, listening, hearing about that, and, and how to uh, be there for them. Well, and I would say for those of us who have had longevity in the industry, it's probably because we've been doing that already all along. I know when I first got started as a trainer, it was really a lot more of getting to understand the person. There was a lot of talk therapy and they used to always say I have the best therapy deal in town because it's way less than a therapist <laughs> and they get a great workout. And, you know, because I was always interested in human behavior as well, that to me was even the more interesting part of getting to see my clients. Like, I want to know how was your day? What were your challenges? What were your successes? You know, and even back then when I was in my mid twenties, just getting to talk with People who were in their 40s and 50s, especially things that I wouldn't talk to my parents about because you don't talk to your parents like that. But I get to get a little peek maybe even inside to my parents' world because I got to talk with these people who are in an age demographic that was similar to them. Also getting to work with people who were younger than me and kind of getting that broad scope of understanding that humans are being faced with challenges all the time. And yes, while it looks like you might be coming in to become more physically fit, you're coming in for a lot more than that. Or maybe you don't even know you're coming in for that and yet you're getting the benefits of that. And absolutely, as we have been putting more focus on mental health, 
I think that is now a very intentional reason why people are seeking out working with somebody. And you're right to have that skill set is going to be critical. And I, I remember back in the day taking my personal trainer certification it was very clear what was in the scope of your bounds and what was not in the scope of your bounds. And I remember those parts on the test that, no, I'm not supposed to get to know my, my clients on a personal level. Like that was actually discouraged. And I thought, well, that's so weird because it's called personal training, but okay. You know, I kind of went and did my thing anyway, but I also know that that is part of the stigma of personal trainers, right? Oh, you just got a certification from the back of the book and I can do my own reps and count how many I do and find this workout, you know, on Instagram and I'll just do that. So if you were, you know, guiding maybe a person who was wanting to work with a trainer, what kinds of things would you suggest that they really research or interview their trainer about to find that good fit? Well, it's interesting. I was just having this conversation. It was like last Friday with uh, a colleague of mine at Colorado State University and also with because I'm meeting people all the time. You know, Michelle, that's my thing. You know, I'm going to meet with people and meeting with a, a new trainer in the business. And I always say for the consumer, there's so much information out there and there's so many videos out there. There's so many articles out there. And to the point where there are a lot of things you could just learn on your own. So as the consumer, you really need to find someone, work with someone that provides a unique point of view and provides a service that you probably just wouldn't do yourself. You would just, you would just not give the effort to do it. That the unique point of view is something that I think a lot of trainers lack when it comes to that. And it could be just the therapeutic aspect of it and putting forth this is your background and expertise in this. And the other thing is not providing uh, programming that is what the client could do themselves easily. Like you, your service needs to feel like it's valuable. You're always looking for what's the value. And so when you're you know, interviewing trainers, I highly recommend the consumer to interview trainers. You have the power. This is your session. It's your money. It's your time. You should not accept something that is less than what you're looking for. So you need to interview a trainer and ask what their experience is, where they were educated, their psychological point of view and working with people, their exercise progression, advancement, what's their education in biomechanics, motor learning, physics, all these things are really important aspects to talk to your trainer about. If they can't answer any of those questions, it's probably time to run to a different person <laughs> for that. But unfortunately, in our business, we're fighting, as Michelle, you know, a huge, huge uphill battle. We have very unregulated business, and it's very easy to do to become a trainer in our business. So I think as the consumer, it's very difficult for the consumer because there's not a lot of there's, it's very difficult to find someone good because not a lot of nuance. There's no guidebook for the consumer to say, well, who's good, who isn't good. You just have to ask a lot of really good questions. Motivational interviewing is really important for the consumer, not just the trainer to do for the client. Be informed uh, about that. But does your potential trainer have a unique point of view? Do they provide a programming that is something that you more than likely would just never do on your own. You got to create that space for them to feel like I, I need to do this because this is something that's such a unique aspect to what I'm looking for. I can't just find a YouTube video and just do that. So I, like, I was telling someone the other day, I was like, okay, well, if you're just doing push pull based exercises and you're doing these base level exercises, whatever that may be for you and the client's like, I, mean, I could just do this on my own. They're going to do three sets of 10 on my own. I mean, your business is probably not going to flourish if that's just your base level. You don't know how to progress from the next variation to the next variation, how to create intensity in different ways like that. I mean, if you have a lot of time in the business, a lot of education, you understand that, but the consumer doesn't. So I'm a big proponent of the consumer actually pushing the personal trainers to be better. Well, I, I definitely endorse that. I think about how much time people research before they're going to purchase a vehicle. And yet you're going to maybe trust somebody with your body and maybe some aspects of your mental health, your motivation. You should probably put as much research behind that to finding the right fit 
as you do any other major investment. And I do see, you know, working with a trainer as an investment. And a lot of people still today like, oh, I don't need to spend my money on that because I just need to do my workout on my own, right? For the, for the person who says, I know what I need to do, I'm just not doing it. A, maybe you don't actually know what you need to do. <laughs> I, I run into that a lot. And the Same. fact that you're not doing it is kind of a big deal. And so I think it's even, you know, from the consumer side, you know, just retraining the perspective that this is an investment in my physical and mental well-being. And yeah, I want to find the right fit so that I maximize, you know, the return on that investment. Yeah. And, and most clients, they look at it in two different ways. It's, a, it's an investment good or it's a temptation good. A lot of humans, essentially the path of, path of least resistance is the temptation good. You get the immediate feedback or the feeling of uh, reward quickly, but the consequences come later. The investment good is the investment is made up front and the consequence, and you really you don't really get a lot out of it until later on down the road, like the larger changes there. We see this in retirement and different areas like that. It's very difficult for a person today to see themselves down the line. That person is not them to them. That person doesn't exist. So you have to teach them about their future self, making that person be a real person and look at the investment good for that. But it, it's it's a human nature based trade. It's not that it's like uncommon. This is extremely common. We're conservation machines. We do what is the path of least resistance. And, and we were never biologically, we're never supposed to be doing what we're doing now, which is working out in gyms holding weird pieces of equipment, running in place to nowhere. These are foreign things to our body. Our technology has greatly surpassed our biology. And we're, it's the mismatch paradox that we're living in. And so we're trying to figure out what that is. But now because of the environment we're in, we have to do things like have more formalized exercise because technology in general is decreasing our activities of daily living, making life much easier. And we're at this precipice where life is almost in developed countries is almost over optimized. If there's not enough stimulus in living, then you have atrophy in life. And that's currently where we're trending towards right now. Yeah, I see that too. And I think about just the classes I teach in that regard. And I, I, I always say, you know, back in the day, we didn't have to do things like this because it was just literally called life. Yeah. I moved my body every day because I had to. Yeah. And all the different kinds of movements I did addressed everything that this thing needed. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't doing things that compromised my body, like sitting in a chronically contracted position mm -hmm. for eight hours a day after day after day after day. So I didn't have to do anything to correct that because I wasn't doing that. Well, now all these modern conveniences are definitely at the expense of our physical, mental, and emotional health. So now we have to be deliberate and intentional. We have to make the choice to do this thing that maybe now we call exercise or we call the healthy lifestyle. And it's, it's always that choice, right? And one of my mottos is hard now or harder later. The hard choice now to whatever you're going to put in your body, if or not, you're going to move your body, whether or not you're going to put your phone down and get some sleep, right? All the hard choices now will probably minimize harder later. And yet, like you said, it's really hard to project out. I'm never going to be that person, yeah. even though that was my mom, my aunt, my sister, whoever, well, that won't be me. Yeah. Except that it probably will be because that's how it goes. So what are some approaches when you're working with a client who is having a hard time envisioning their future self? What are some ways that you maybe can get them to buy into the idea that investment in you now is going to pay off for your future self? I think one of the first things I always say is it's, it's a complicated relationship to give people permission that it's okay to feel strange about your future self. I think one of the things we often do is like, you need to change. Let's do this. You need to look at this self. This is, you're going to be better for this. But to first validate and acknowledge their feelings of that I just don't see myself as this person and say, it's okay that you have those feelings and let's discuss those feelings. 
is there may be something deeper there of why they don't see their future self beyond just the basic biology for that. Maybe they were socialized into believing that you don't really have a future, honestly, or that, you know, when you get a certain age, this is just what happens to people. To find out what are those underlying, the underlying self-talk or the influences other people have provided for them. And then the other thing is just to help them understand the biological and anthropological history of being a human being. And it's one thing trainers just don't have any knowledge of. Fit trainers should be historians of our business, not just great at how does someone squats well, a movement screen and all that. I mean, that's great and all, but like we got to go backwards to move forward. And I think we all need to become fitness historians, but ancient fitness historians and understand the research and observational data from early humans and, and how our biology is so similar to those people. Why? And as a good link to why we're struggling. So I talk to people about those things. You need to be educated about why you feel the way you feel. And what are the environmental factors you're facing, uh, the social determinants of health, all those things as well. And then just to be honest with people, I believe in honesty and transparency with clients and, and to tell them this will not be easy. This showing up will not be easy. It's going against everything your body and your mind is telling you to do. But we're in this together. We're on a journey together. This is not just your journey. It's my journey, too, with you. We're going to grow together in this relationship. I'm going to be supportive and caring and kind with you. There's going to be great times. We're going to have a lot of laughs. And there's going to be sad times for that. I'm sure you've experienced this, Michelle, you know, in different parts of your training, like when a client's family member dies during the time you're working with them. You know, I just had that, a client whose mother just passed away this Monday. And we're just talking to them about it and being gentle with them and being there for them. And there's going to be more of that. And there's going to be great triumph as well within that. Are they just being relatable is really important. And just talking to people like this gives them confidence that you're going to be with them. Because I found that in my time, like a lot of clients are worried that you're not going to be around too. Like a lot of trainers don't realize this. They think that, well, I don't have clients. Why this and that? Well, maybe they're just also thinking, are you actually into this business? Will you be around there for me? Because so, because the lifespan of our of trainers in our business is 12 months and under. Most of us don't last longer than 12 months. So you and I doing it this long is, a, is an aberration almost, you know? So why would I invest in something when the person is going to leave me anyways, probably to become, to do a different job, go into a different industry, assuring them that you'll be there as long as you need them in the journey, I think is really important. It's something we as trainers do not think about in the client's point of view. You're right. I never thought of that. And probably because I, I knew I wasn't going anywhere, you know, unless for whatever reason, which did happen, I did move away when I first went to grad school in Boulder and then I moved. You know, what's interesting is sometimes you don't really fully appreciate how important you as the trainer are into somebody's life until you leave. And they write you all these amazing letters and cards about what a really important piece of their own day-to-day -day life you've been. And I think having that appreciation in the moment versus when I'm going to leave it is probably something that does strengthen that bond and that connection. And I think it goes back to that very you know first thing you said about human connection. Because I know not every trainer has the personality like us that actually wants to know yeah. On a deeper level, the people they're working with, they really are about the nuts and bolts, the X's and O's, the, you know, the mechanics of it all. And it does take a certain personality to want to establish that relationship. And so maybe for some people, it is identifying that. And then maybe it's not personal training that is the right fit within the fitness industry. But there's another type of career within the fitness industry that does lend itself to that kind of personality. And this is, I think, all where kind of that interviewing process on both sides is really important to make sure not just the consumer, but I think from the trainer's point of view as well. I think one of the reasons trainers don't last, number one, physically they burn out, right? You don't show up, you don't get paid. That was a that was a big thing early on in my career. Like, yeah, I have to physically be there every minute to earn a dollar. And at some point, you just can't keep up that kind of pace. 
But I think also trainers do get burned out because they get bored or, you know, they feel like they're investing all of their energy and maybe their client isn't seeing results that they think they should see. And so then the trainer takes that personally and they get frustrated and that leads to burnout. So maybe advice for trainers coming into it. What do you have when it comes to maybe reaching beyond that 12 month kind of average longevity? Yeah, I think, well, several things. And this is part of a, a new mentorship program project that I'm doing with several team members about this. But I, I think, one, you have to identify, and, and other people have heard this, but hopefully this will become more unique, but your why industry, you know, a lot of people get in because they like working out and stuff. That's a bad reason to be in the business, just because you like to work out. That's It's got to be deeper than that, because to be in the business for a long time, you will you will need to transcend that reason in order to have a thriving business for that. And I, it was my college students. I talk to them about that all the time. You know, when you're 20, you're very vain. You know, you know when you, it's, everything's about your aesthetics and things and how you look. And you may want to be in the business because you like working out. That, but that will not keep you in the business. I always say it's easy to get in the business, hard to stay in it. Very hard to stay in it. And I think so making sure that you understand your why but really evaluate, is this a job you actually want to do? Like, I think you, you just kind of said that. It's like, you may need to move in a different portion of the business. I actually think personal training is one of the more difficult jobs to do. It requires a tremendous amount of, especially if you have your own business, like myself, yourself, you have to have great business acumen. You have to be incredibly charismatic. We are a performer. You have to be genuinely empathetic with people. You have to have great conversational skills. How many people have all these skills, by the way? <laughs> it's like, it's not a huge percentage of population, but we have a lot of trainers. And so I think you need to evaluate, is this really your thing? The other thing I would heavily, heavily invest in, I did this when I first started, I do it now, is invest in therapy. Invest in yourself. Learn how to deal with your own issues. Do not put that stuff on other people when you're working with them. They're not paying you to hear your stories about your problems, your issues. Invest in stress coping mechanisms, therapy, meditation, whatever it is that feels uh, like good for you. Invest in yourself is really important. Your, your personal self-care is a gift to other people. Because think about it this way. This is the thing I think trainers don't think about or clients don't think about. When you take care of yourself, you invest in your own self-care, you give other people confidence in your abilities to take care of them. If you don't, you think about it, if someone's ailing, let's say you have a partner and they're ailing from whatever it may be, if you're not taking care of yourself, their confidence is probably pretty low in you to take care of them for that. So investing in your own self-care, your own health and well-being and all aspects of that gives other people in your life confidence in you. It's a gift you're giving other people. And look at your service in the industry as a gift to other people as well for that. And I think the other aspect of that advice is just continue to transcend the basics of the, of the job. As you keep growing as a human, one of the things I think we do in our business, but this is any business, is when we need to grow, we need to do something, we reach out to people when we need something. But we don't, we don't nurture these things when we don't need something for that. Meet a lot of people. Keep pushing yourself to make great connections with clients, without clients. Keep nurturing those relationships. Training is super relationship oriented. You have to nurture those relationships. And then let your clients see how well you nurture the relationships of other people in your life too. Clients are always watching you. They're always watching how you treat your significant other, your children, your friendships, the type of places you go. They're observing that behavior. Again, I think that they want to know you're going to stick around and that you have good quality things in your life, not just how fit you are, but just how you treat other people in life and how well you care about taking care of yourself. I think we don't teach our trainers any of this stuff. We just teach them chronic adaptation, acute adaptation biomechanics, motor learning, maybe, maybe, even that too. We give them no tools to be successful in the business. We give them no mentorship for people to talk to when they're struggling, to making money in the beginning especially. You need to have someone ride with you and be there for you 
then this also helps our business become more legitimate. when We have better programs, social programs for trainers to become better. Without that, we just have what is essentially a hobbyist profession, which many people have made it. And it's our fault. Our industry, it's our, our fault. The industry's fault. I'm not blaming individuals. I'm blaming our industry for not doing a better job of making it more legitimate too. Well, I agree with that. In fact, way back when I started and, you know, people ask, what do you do? I'm a personal trainer. The second question is, oh, what else do you do? Yeah. Right? Because it wasn't ever conceivable that like this is an actual profession. It's a side hustle before side hustles were a thing. Mm -hmm. And it is unfortunate that is still very much the case. And for some people, maybe that's okay. Maybe this is another element of a way to feed their passion and give back because they have these skills. But I think a lot of people do go into it thinking it will be a career or it's a stepping stone, right? It's something to do until the next great thing comes along. <laughs> and you're right. When you as the trainer are not really invested, well, how much are you really going to give? How much of a difference are you really going to make? Are you really giving that client what they you know, are, are deserving? Probably not. Because when you're not invested, why would you? Yeah. And also yeah. you're seeing examples regularly of people leaving the business. Even the most accomplished people I know in the business, especially, and I'm just talking about personal training, generally leave training. They don't, they ended up doing something else or they end up going, well, that was just something I did when I was younger. And also there's, there's a shame to being a trainer that a lot of trainers feel. And you talked about this a little bit and other people have made us feel that way, but we've also made ourselves feel that way is that, we don't look at it as a legitimate business. So we go, I'm just doing this on the side or, you know, I just, is just my stepping stone to becoming a physical therapist, whatever. And that's great. Do your thing. But we need more lifetime trainers. We need more long-term trainers. People have been in it for a really long time and that's what they want to do. They aspire to be a trainer for their life. And that's, that's one of my goals is, is to stay being a trainer in my entire existence professionally, regularly, full-time to be an example that you can do this as your lifelong career. But we're seeing what what we see is so many people who go from being a trainer to being a fitness manager, fitness director, a GM. Again, nothing wrong with that, but we don't have enough people who are just training long term and celebrating that. You should never have shame about being a trainer, a lifelong trainer. If your end goal is to just be a trainer the rest of your life, I celebrate you. We need to celebrate that. This is not a stepping stone job. This is a legitimate profession and job to be in. And we need to see more of us doing that. Yeah, I agree. And as somebody who, you know, has been doing this for almost 27 years, my my career did evolve. I mean, when the economy crashes and nobody is paying for personal trainers, I still got to pay my bills, right? And so I think there can be evolution as well as maybe some complementary things but even in what I currently do, I am still using my personal training skills because it is still all within the wellness, right? It's a holistic approach. And movement is one piece of that. There are other, uh, so many other pieces, obviously, that impact somebody's physical, mental, and emotional well-being. And there was a time when I wasn't training any clients at all. And I missed that because that was my one-on-one -on -one fill my cup to get to help somebody individually, you know, versus all the mass corporate wellness things that I also love. Right. And so I found it for me that I don't want to do for personal training full time. I burn out. I only have so much to give. I have a capacity and to give one on one all the time to be able to support my life. I mean, from a financial standpoint, it would not be possible. I know that because I tried and it just wasn't. And yet I also didn't want to not do that because it, it served a different purpose in my life, right? Knowing that I have this direct impact on this person that I know personally, that I care about. They're not just a name in a room or a face in a room that I may or may never see again, but there's somebody I'm going to have a consistent relationship with. And even though, you know, now we have the option of virtual, which is a great option for some people, I would say it's not a great option for everybody because depends on what your setup is and if that client is going to be okay with that, right? So there are a lot of different things that we can do now that maybe weren't really options 10, 15 years ago. 
And still, I think any personal trainer can craft their profession in a way that fills them up, supports them, and gives a really great, valuable product to those that you're that you're serving. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, I think you, your example is exactly what I'm talking about, what we were talking about. Some people are going to be in the business full time and do a lot of other things. Like there's me, I full time train, but I like that. I have that capacity. I enjoy it. I, it's very difficult for me to reach my limit with one on one with people for that. But I know that about myself. Other people know differently about themselves. And now there's no better time to be in the business because there's so many pathways to be in the business, to make money and to be a personal trainer for it. But I, I still think we just, a lot of people are just leaving it very quickly and there's not enough examples. And we need more examples. You can make a lot of money. I hear from my students, they don't think they can. It's definitely possible. I've done it. I've helped many people do that. I know a lot of people doing it, actually training full time, doing really well for themselves. It's just you need help. You need people to help you. That's why mentorship is so important. We're nobody's stepping stone. None of that. We don't need to, need to stop thinking of ourselves that way. Plus, I do a bunch of stuff, too. A lot of stuff. I probably have three full-time jobs based on how the stuff I'm always doing. The training is always there for me. In the beginning, when I was a younger, younger man, and now as a 45-year-old man, I think it will always be there for me. But I also have a lot of other interests. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have other interests. Believe me, I have tons of other interests. But, you know, I always feel bad when someone leaves the profession completely, like completely. And you and I know this happens a lot. And they become a real estate agent or a broker or an insurance salesman because, you know, everybody has different situations where they have family members, the people they got to support. I just wish our business needs to be better to keep those people. We have to find ways to keep those people in our business because they don't want to be doing those other jobs. No matter what they tell you, oh, I'm getting a paycheck. They don't want to do that. We haven't done a good job of keeping those people who want to be in our profession. We're, have, we're pushing people to do stuff they don't want to do. They hate their jobs, but they're making money. We got to change that. Yeah. Well, and I also see a lot of times, like maybe an older, older, like us. We're it's, older it's, trainers. <laughs> it's a second career. Yeah. So they've done the corporate thing or the, right. whatever. And now they're like, I don't want to do that anymore. Now I'm going to yeah. go and live my passion. And so I do see it that way as well. And That's true. I mean, I think it's important to have trainers of all ages. I remember when I was in my 20s and I didn't understand my clients who were 50 and were like, oh, I just need to stretch today. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> we're not stretching. We've got this workout to do. Right? <laughs> and now I'm like, oh, I think I just need to stretch today. <laughs> so perspective is really valuable. And you can't have that perspective when you're 24 because so you haven't been 50. You don't know what it's like, right? Most um, definitely. And I'm sure, Darren, you have clients or had in the past who are 70s and 80s, right? Mm -hmm. They are living their future self. Yes. And some of them have never exercised before, and now they are because they realize, oh, my goodness, I don't have the strength. I don't have the stamina. I don't have the energy. And my doctor said, hey, why don't you try working out? And I don't know what to do, so let me work with a trainer. So let's talk about the you know, the uh, second half of the of life where we're maybe have a little bit more free time or discretionary income or maybe that need because we are feeling the effects of aging and maybe not having taken the greatest care of ourselves. How do we speak to that population? It's a great population. Actually, as I've because of most of my clients have been with me forever. They have quite a new people, a lot of new people as well, but I have a lot of people in their late fifties, early sixties. I have one 71 year old currently who was amazing. And those conversations are interesting because they're about end of life conversations as well. And the, you know, feeling your mortality, knowing you're not going to be around a while. They're functional independence conversations as well. Um, I always tell people that exercise becomes even greater and more valuable the older you get. It's a big selling point to clients who are coming to me or any trainer as they get older because they're in that morbidity window. They're experiencing a time where 
either they may be experiencing chronic conditions, um, may be experiencing orthopedic issues, metabolic issues, whatever it may be. And exercise is truly potential longevity extender, but also a decreaser of all-cause mortality. And so those conversations are a bit different with those clients because we're really talking about like, this is like the back half here. We're on the back half. The reality is we're all going to die. And I like to, I'm very honest with people about that. I don't like to sugarcoat stuff. I just feel like, listen, we're on the back half here. And how do you want that to be? How do you want this last part of your life to be? Do you want it to be bedridden or hobbled by a variety of injuries? Or do you want to be thriving? You want that, you want to compress that morbidity window. So you're just going up, 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 up. Sounds bad, dead. <laughs> it's like, you know, and that's what we want. We want you to have a nice, beautiful decline, this kind of beautiful end. And I know we don't like to talk about death in our society, but it's really important to discuss. And one of the biggest things I ever did when I was in my 20s, I took a death and dying class and during my undergraduate degree. It was life altering, changing. We had to volunteer at a nursing home for an entire semester. I took care of people who are at the end of their lives. And I realized that is going to be me one day, but I, will, I don't want to be there. I don't want to be in that home. I want to be thriving all the way until it's over for that. So I, I was actually feel like the best clients to me are always the ones who feel their mortality. The, the younger clients just think they're invincible. They think they don't see that person. They don't understand the future them. It does not exist to them. They won't even give it any consideration. But I think the best thing you could do is realize that you will be at that point. It will happen. No one's conquering death <laughs> here on this planet. I'm like, it's over. And knowing that finite aspect to living is what gives a lot of people the push to accomplish things. I always tell people like the conversation about immortality is kind of irrelevant to me because majority of people wouldn't do anything with it anyways. So it's, it's time just because you have a lot of time doesn't mean you'll do much with it. Any, you know? No, I think you're right. I think it's because we know we have finite time, right? That that's why all of a sudden there's the bucket list. Like, Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right now. So I, tr I only train three people. They all live in my building and they're mm -hmm. all 80 years old. And I love, love every one of them for very different reasons. And then I have parents who are 79 and 80 and I'm pretty, I'm actually incredibly proud of my mom. I'm going to give her a big shout out. She was a stubborn, I don't like walking. I don't want to do this, you know, all these things. She was always very active, but, but there were many years where I saw her physical stamina decline. And I had a tough love conversation. I said, you can either participate with this family or you can choose to not. And you're going to miss out on all the great things that we still get to do. And the fact that you are still very healthy. I would hope you're going to choose to participate with this family. Well, she took that seriously. And they're in Wisconsin. She walks laps in the basement because mm -hmm. Wisconsin is very cold in the winter. Yeah. And she walks her laps. And every, you know, so often she'll text me her progress. And she stops and does some push-ups around the laps. And doing this on her own. And my dad, too, he decides, okay, I need to be doing something. And, you know, they've had me for a daughter for 51 years. Yeah. So it's not like they don't know what to do or they don't have... Yeah access to somebody who can give them some guidance and you know the stretches and the things that keep his back feeling okay and all those things that every now and then my little voice is probably screaming in their brains like okay we should do this because otherwise michelle's gonna be disappointed just you know reverse uh reverse roles here with mm -hmm. parents and children yeah yeah most definitely i, I actually i really enjoy that population I just think they, they've they lived such a long time. Their wisdom is so high at that point. The stubbornness is high too. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. but I think there's like, they, they want to have as much quality time as possible in whatever time is left. And I take a lot of information from that quite a bit. And I always want to be, as someone who's considerably younger to them right now, to to see my future self. I want to see my future self. I want to embrace my future self. And I want to embrace the end of my life and be like, man, I had a great time. I, I crushed it. I took care of myself emotionally, socially, spiritually, physically, all aspects. I tried to be as enlightened as possible. 
and I tried to give the gift of self-care to my family because I don't, I don't want to be someone that, that has, I don't want to have my family to have low confidence in me and my ability to be there for them. Again, I go back to that. I just think we're not thinking about it that way. Like, how does your, how does your wellness affect other people's confidence in you? And that's incredibly important to me. And I think as, as a son, as a husband, as a father, I want my family to feel confident and I don't want them to worry about my health. I, so I need to do my job on that. Yeah. No, I, I love that message. And I think it is never too young or too old to start. And that's the thing. I think people do get maybe to a certain age and they're like, well, what's the point now? Or maybe they were always really, really, really fit. And because they're not going to be that anymore, they think, yeah. eh, I can't be that. So why bother? And that's yeah. a hard mentality to bust through. And it yeah. is about us helping them see a different perspective um, yeah. and appreciate what we still can do, not worry about w what we can no longer do. But yeah. let's appreciate what we can do and all the new things that maybe you'll get to do because you didn't want to take time to do those because you were busy doing these other things instead. And yeah, I think through all those conversations, there's, there are so many ways to, to get people to buy in that taking care of this is going to be the best investment you can ever make. Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. I, I'm just a big proponent of it. You know, again, it's easier said than done in our population, but these conversations are important. And I think having unique perspectives on it. That's why I talk about the whole taking yourself as a gift to others. It's just stuff we don't hear a lot. We hear about taking care of ourselves, investing in ourselves. We don't think about that transfer, how it affects other people. And uh, oftentimes in our current population, we're too, we're too selfish. It's good to be selfish, but not, in, but like not thinking about how our investment is actually a great investment to other people. It compounds the interest of their feelings of us. And that I think is one of the greatest things about taking care of yourself is you're literally stacking money in the bank for other people. Like you're paying them. <laughs> you're really like, hey, I will be there for you because I'm doing everything I can to be there for you for that. And that's a great example for doing that. And your vitality is so important. Your vibrancy, which may have really not beyond your physical wellness, just your vitality in life, your approach to being alive. What is that? Have you ever thought about kind of who you are existentially, you know, in life, how that affects other people, your projection of who you are? And, you know, it's, for me, it's a journey about becoming yourself. It's a long journey and you're always evolving in that journey. It's difficult because early in life, we often try to play a character of, that other people, we think other people want us to be. And my thing is always put away that character costume, just be yourself and keep working towards that, whatever evolution of that, that is. Life's too short to be playing someone else's role. That is such a great message to wrap us up on. That was wonderful. I love that. Uh, before we officially sign off, is there anything that we have not covered that you think is important for the listeners? I think we, we did a pretty good job covering quite a bit of things. I want to just say I have a lot of gratitude for you, Michelle, and all the years that we've known each other. And, you know, you're one of my very early podcast guests in there. And I, I enjoyed our conversations we've had early and just so nice, the friendships that you have and the connections through our circle of people we know. It's just very rewarding to to see that and to see you being vibrant and healthy and and I see your posts on LinkedIn and things that you're doing. I'm proud of you. You're yeah. doing a lot of good in the world. Keep doing that. Well, thank you. It is very much mutual. There is probably rarely a day that goes by that you don't pop into my mind for one reason or another because you. you have opened up my network of people to so many incredible. And I'm almost talking to at least one of them almost every day. Amazing. And so it is amazing. And that was definitely one of the best response, you know, things I ever responded to was that LinkedIn message that you sent going yeah. on five years ago now. Yeah. So, yeah. So same to you. I love that you are now a resident of my state. So welcome to That's Colorado. Right. And one That's of these right. days, we're actually going to see each other in person. We are. That is for great. sure. We got to make that happen. Excellent. Thank you so much, Michelle. Of course. We're going to put all the ways to get people connected with you in the show notes. And everybody, thank you for listening. 
Hopefully you got some really good nuggets out of this one. And now you get to go and be a better being. Thank you for listening to the Be A Better Being podcast. Michelle and Sasha hope that what you heard today inspires you to embrace this journey of life with an open mind, a kind heart, and a willingness to learn and evolve. If you enjoyed the content, please help spread their message by subscribing, sharing, and leaving a five-star review. If you have a show topic idea or would like to be a guest, please visit betterbeings.net and fill out a contact form. Until next time, go and be a better being.